Uh, hello, today we're starting into the second chapter of The Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir. And uh, to help me out, I have a very special guest, uh, honorary professor Wendell George. Uh, <laughs> say hi. Say hi. And uh, he's going to help me talk a little bit about uh, the development of our values over time. So uh, you ready to go to the philosophy lab? <laughs> you ready to go to the philosophy lab, Wendell? Yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> All right. So here we are in the philosophy lab where Wendell is going to demonstrate uh, the extent of his freedom for you. Um, so Beauvoir talks about how um, in childhood, children have freedom. I mean, human beings are for itself. Old Wendell here is the spontaneous upsurgence of freedom into the world, aren't you? Yeah, spontaneous upsurgence of freedom. Tell them, say I'm free. But at this stage, I mean, look what I just did to him. I just picked him up, I held him up, he thought it was kind of funny, um, but I exerted power over him basically like he's an object. So the though he is free, and he does stuff on his own for himself, he has little baby projects, um, who knows what he's going to do right now. So even though he is free and he has baby projects that he freely endeavors, like right now his <laughs> project is going to be to try to get the cat. This is one of his, the fav his favorite uses of his freedom is to interact with Isolde, the cat. His activity though is largely inconsequential. The worst thing that's going to happen to him right here is his old's going to get mad and she's going to tell him to stop by nipping at him, basically. But if my spouse and I are doing our jobs, um, <laughs> no real consequences will befall Wendell for, the, uh, for him using his freedom. He can play, um, but nothing sort of is lasting particularly um, at any given time. So there's no real responsibility put on him right now. Um, he can pull on this tripod. It might fall over and scare him. Largely though, he is free from lasting consequences for his actions. Again, because my spouse and I are looking out for him. And oftentimes our looking out for him means we treat him just as an object. We, I just took that from him, right? And he's going to go after it again. As you can see, he's persistent, but I just move it and say, no, buddy, that's not for you. He's starting to understand no uh, and that kind of thing. But for the most part, he exercises his freedom without too much consequence. without too much consequence, and we act on him as a sort of object, and we determine his future. Like, he eats the food that we give him, he goes to the daycare, or doesn't go to the daycare, as is the case right now, that we send him to. When If we move, he'll go with us, he'll go to schools that we select, and so on. So all of those big projects that his life will revolve around, at this stage, are determined by us. And as he grows and learns more, we'll tell him about our values and he will adapt and pick up on values that uh, we largely give to him. And Beauvoir's point is that at this stage, under the sort of glow of childhood, our values that our parents present to us and that we pick up from school or church or wherever, they appear to us like they're just facts of the world like they're written in heaven, like, oh, mommy and daddy say so, and they have done all of this other stuff for me, they, they're the complete structure of my life, and so the things they tell me must just be a fact of the world, right? So what's going to happen, Beauvoir is quick to point out, is that as we grow, and especially in adolescence, when we all hit that rebellious uh, phase, those values come into question, right? He loves to drum. This is the other thing he loves. This is his cha his drumming chair that he likes. Go ahead, Wendell, drum for him. Show them your freedom. So again, you can see he clearly has the intentional structure. 
He's able to identify objects. He has little projects and plans that he goes for. Um, but it's mostly wrapped up in play. And again, a lot of the sort of life project stuff is determined by, well, me and my spouse. So we're going to step back out of the philosophy lab <laughs> here for a second, and uh, we'll continue on with our reading of The Ethics of Ambiguity. So uh, thanks for your help, Wendell. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You are very helpful. He's like, what are you doing to me? Okay. Uh, hello, we're back from the philosophy lab. Uh, very exciting help from my assistant Wendell there. I appreciate it. So the takeaway that I really want to focus on just before we leave this uh, section of the ethics of ambiguity is basically that the world of adults is the serious world. And I had mentioned in the previous video that seriousness and the serious person was going to be a big um, emphasis in the chapter that we're now reading. So this idea of seriousness is basically the idea that the values, particularly values, are given, that they're just facts in the world that are sort of threaded into the very fabric of reality, so to speak, and that they exist out there independently of human existence, human interactions, commitments, and projects, and all that kind of stuff. So the, the world of adults is the serious world, and like I was saying, for the child, these values that are taught by mommy and daddy, that they learn at school, and so on, appear as fact. Um, but of course, what happens is what we witnessed with Wendell was this playful freedom, right? I mean, he didn't experience real consequences for his action. He was able to continue and do his thing. And again, I acted on him as if he were an object. And I and my spouse make plans for him. I mean, everything that he does is determined in a, in a large way by what we do, what, where we send him to school and where we move and so on and so forth. What happens, not just in adolescence, is this first a kind of rebellion, a recognition that there are cracks in the serious world, and that the adults don't have all of the answers exactly. The fact is it is very rare for the infantile world to maintain itself beyond adolescence. From childhood on, flaws begin to be revealed in it. With astonishment, revolt, and disrespect, the child little by little asks himself, why must I act in that way? What good is it? And what will happen if I act in another way? He discovers his, his subjectivity. He discovers that of others. And when he arrives at the age of adolescence, he begins to vacillate because he notices the contradictions among adults as well as their hesitations and weaknesses. Men stop appearing as if they were gods. Um, and the adolescent discovers the human character of the reality about him. Language, customs, ethics, and values have their source in these uncertain creatures. The moment has come when he, too, is going to be called upon to participate in their operation. His acts weigh upon the earth as much of, as those of other men. So what accompanies this rebellion is the taking over of their freedom in a more thoroughly responsible way. And we start to call on children to participate in the maintenance of the values in the world. So we want our child to continue to go to church or to vote in a particular way or to take over the family business and as they enter adolescence and border on adulthood they start to have to make decisions about that for themselves um, whether or not to continue to take our values to change them to adapt our ends that we have set out for them to go to school or to do um, whatever it is we're asking and their decisions begin to take on more concrete consequences that are lasting. They begin to take over from their parents and their caretakers the responsibility for what their life is going to look like in the future and so on. But it's this process of one, recognition on the part of the child. I think that's really important that the child comes into their freedom and their uh, responsibility and they begin to question. So there again is the importance of the question and questioning. They put the values that they've been taught into doubt 
in this sort of rebellious stage. So on the one hand, you have that recognition of their own freedom and subjectivity in the sort of rebelliousness of adolescence. On the other hand, you have the increasing demands of other people that they meet in the world to participate in the making of meaning and to help to ground and establish the projects and meanings that we are all sort of navigating together. So you have their self-recognition and then you have the claims being made on their freedom by others. So at the same time as they're coming into ownership of their freedom and taking on more responsibility and the consequences are becoming more greater, other people are also making a demand and making claims on that freedom and calling them to participate in the generation of values and the maintaining of social norms and structures. But it will always be up to the student, or always up to the, the person to decide how they're going to do that or whether they're not they're going to continue to do that or whether that they're going to reject those values or try to form new ones or revise them in some way and so on and so forth. So that's how the serious world of the adults crumble. Um, I'm going to leave this particular video here um, because I think that what Wendell helped us with was very important. When I come back in the next video, I am going to discuss basically something that I think is racist in Beauvoir. I skipped over it a little bit here, but she mentions the infantile world of the slaves that in slavery some people can be kept in an infantile world. Um, I just want to sort of talk back against that a little bit. Um, I want to give Beauvoir the most generous reading on that point that I can, but at the end of the day I think that the, that particular uh, claim that she makes is a product of racism and that she evolves on that issue later and uh, becomes a little bit more sophisticated in her view um, of oppression basically um, so I'll start the next video with that uh, fun <laughs> subject uh, and we will then just continue from there uh, and we'll begin to look at these psychological profiles as you're going to sketch in this chapter beginning with first the sub uh, man and then the serious one which we've been sort of building up to this idea of seriousness and we saw that sketched out here in the serious world of the adults again where we think that those values are transcendental absolute objects that exist independently of human activity or existence whatsoever that they're just facts woven into the fabric of reality or whatever the case may be okay so we'll leave it there i hope you enjoyed this particular video i had fun uh making it and i will see you in the next discussion